The, uh, I want to talk about the, uh, my book, Cassandra and Oz, Counterinsurgency of Future War, which is really talking about the Army and the Marine Corps trying to learn and adapt to, future, to uh, current modern warfare under fire. Uh, this, uh, this is actually, this sign is outside the, the main embassy in Baghdad. That, uh, that struck me as, as something kind of unusual. I, I don't know, does that mean that everybody else was drinking while armed? I don't know. <laughs> that maybe some of the decisions that came out of that, that particular structure, they may have been. Uh, my background, the, the term, because I was actually named to Cassandra by a couple of uh, reporters from uh, National Public Radio, uh, looking at some of the things I had done before the war. Uh, back in, uh, in 2001, I actually done a, a study called Avoiding Vietnam, looking at the American response to the war in Southeast Asia, and said the American military Instead of deciding to learn from the experience, their lesson really is we're just going to avoid these kind of wars anymore. And instead of trying to learn how to do them better, we're going to learn how to avoid them. And I said it was time to develop a new counterinsurgency doctrine for the United States. And then in uh, 2000 and late 2002, I was put in charge of a joint interagency team for the Army to figure out how to reconstruct Iraq. And that George Oliver here from the Naval War College faculty was also on that team. And we came up with a plan to reconstruct Iraq. Uh, it really was not in our purview to say not to do this, but the, the consensus of the team was this is stupid. But that was not our purview. So we came up with, we, basically our goal was to show how hard it was going to be to reconstruct Iraq. Uh, problem was that we finished our study on the same day that Secretary Rumsfeld created the Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Affairs under Jay Garner. So the Army was then no longer interested in our plan because the Army no longer had the responsibility to reconstruct Iraq. We did actually furnish it to the planners in uh, in the Middle East, in Kuwait, uh, who were doing it, and it did influence the what reconstruction plan was there, but it all got derailed when Ambassador Bremer showed up and started disbanding the Iraqi army and some of the other decisions he made. But we tried. And because of these, I, I got a certain amount of notoriety as somebody who had seen what was coming and had predicted it and had just been ignored. If, you, if you're aware that, that anybody know Greek mythology, the story of Cassandra? Yeah, Cassandra is cursed by Apollo to always have to be, tell truth to people and never be believed. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that's always the problem. You can tell truth to power, but getting heard is the problem. Uh, what happens though is in, because of this and because of my connection to Dave Petraeus, who was a classmate of, of, for George and I, he drew me in in uh, late 2005 to become the author or the lead author for New Counterinsurgency Doctrine. Uh, he and James Mattis for the Marine Corps, he came up with this idea of that it was time to change the way the Army and Marine Corps dealt with warfare. They, they're both veterans of Iraq. They, uh, they had seen the problems out there and they knew that the services needed to change to deal with the complexities of modern warfare. So this was kind of the Dave Petraeus model, which was basically built on getting a lot of teams out to the field to figure out what was going on and bringing that information back to get into training, education, and also doctrine. And I tell people that, you know, my role in this is I was, I was one tooth on one cog in Dave Petraeus' engine of change, which is basically what I was. And so I was going to be in charge of coming up with a new doctrine for counterinsurgency, which also become a driving intellectual force for other doctrinal changes to come. Uh, it was a very atypical process to develop, which is FM 324, which was the counterinsurgency manual, the doctrine for the Army and the Marine Corps. Uh, the, uh, it was done in less than a year, which is light speed for anybody who dealt with military bureaucracy and military <coughs> doctrine. Uh, and it wasn't just uniform people. We had all kinds of, we had the civilian academics. Uh, Montgomery McFate, who's on the, uh, also at the National Naval War College, is an anthropologist there, was one of the key players on our team. We had uh, the, uh, the Army and Marine authors. We had uh, uh, the Sarah Sewell, who was the director of the, the Center for uh, the Carr Center for Human Rights at Harvard, was one of the key players in the early uh, shaping phase of the manual. Uh, we had people from think tanks. We had representatives of the media: uh, Jim Fallows, uh, George Packer, Greg Jaffe. Brought in, it was, so it, it was really a big. You know, General Petraeus used to call it his big tent. We had a big tent. If somebody criticized the manual, you'd bring him into the tent and try to make him part of the team. Uh, 
we, uh, we had a, a vetting conference where we invited experts to look at it and I suggested that we have 30 smart people come in to talk about it. Uh, the uh, General Petraeus said, that's fine, you can bring it up. I just want to pick who the 30 people are. <laughs> we ended up with 150. So his, his idea of 30 was much different than my idea of 30. But uh, it was, uh, again, there were smart people from all over the United States. In fact, international. We had Australians, Brits. Uh, a lot of other countries were interested as well. And they all contributed to it. Also, the interagency. I got a lot of great ideas from the CIA, for instance, uh, from uh, Robert Smith, William Smith, and John Smith. <laughs> I, I call them the Smith brothers. But that, that, uh, but the bottom line is it was, a, it, was a, it was a big effort. A lot of different people contributed. General Petraeus read every word. And I'll tell you, he's, a, he's an SOB as an editor, too. I'll say I, I still have PTSD over what I call Petraeus pronouns. If you ever write a sentence with this is or it is, make sure that the this or the it have a very clear precedent. And we had some many interesting discussions about some of the pronouns in the, in the manual. Now, the intent of the manual was really to be focused on any kind of counterinsurgency, but because of the the way it was edited, uh, it really ended up focusing very much on Iraq. Uh, the uh, after the, the the final drafts were done, it was sent out to the field for uh, review. We got 4,000 comments back from the field. Almost all of them focused on the soldier in Afghanistan and Iraq and what they were seeing at that time. Also, the last people to look at it are general general officers and they had all just come back from Iraq. So the final version of the manual was focused very much on what was going on in Iraq and what would be needed in Iraq. Uh, any of you familiar with the doctrine? What came out of it? Well, it, was, it was different from the way we had approached it before. It was population-centric, was focused more on protecting the population and killing bad guys, but you still have to kill bad guys too. It wasn't just focused on protecting the population, but the first priority was protecting the people. And the goal is to accept the government as legitimate. Though the definition of legitimate is, is a hard one to come up with. It's very much locally defined. You know, it, it's, uh, we had some real battles over that in the writing team as well. You gotta be very careful how you apply force in this kind of war. You don't wanna kill uh, five enemies and create 50 more because of the backlash. And it's a mosaic war. And I'm gonna say it's a mosaic war it's different from village to village, valley to valley, town to town, city to city. It, it's, it's very hard to understand the big picture because it varies from piece to piece. That's why I call it a mosaic war. You need a lot of help. Military force is not gonna be successful by itself. You need political help. You need you know, central services, you need economic development. There's a lot of things involved. You need a lot of civilian help, a lot of interagency help to be successful in this kind of war. And especially for, you know, these are always away games for us. We're always going to leave. So one of our big problems has always been we have to establish a host nation authority that's capable of sustaining itself once we leave. We failed at that in Vietnam. We're having similar problems in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, we, the intelligence for the, for the new doctrine was very different from the past. It's not your typical military intelligence. It was very much cultural anthropology. Very much social structures, gender roles, political power, who has political power and why, how does how is this our decisions made? How do people interact? You had to really crack into the human networks to figure out how to fight this kind of war. Very different kind of intelligence. And I'll talk about what campaign design in a minute, but you've also one other problem with this kind of war. When, when, when the army that George and I entered, you knew who the bad guys were. It was the next Soviet rifle regiment coming over the hill. Modern warfare is a lot different. Before you can start to plan, you gotta figure out what your problem set is. And that's why you have to have this process called campaign design. You've got to dis you also are usually fighting a network of different enemies that take different approaches, and you gotta figure out what that is. Uh, information, managing, you gotta manage information very carefully. Perceptions are reality in this kind of war. It's more important what people think you have done than what you have actually done. And that's one of the problems we have dealing with some of like Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. They've been very good at manipulating the media to ch change the message. It's a battle over the narrative. Again, it's what people believe happens is more important than what happens. Uh, the main theme of learn and adapt, well, is in the manual, working with John Nagel especially, who one of the people on the writing team, really pushed this idea of learning and adapting. That's what modern warfare is all about. That's what General Mattis and General 
Petraeus are trying to do for the Marine Corps and the Army. They're trying to make military forces that can learn and adapt. Uh, the dominant approach is what we call clear hold build. You clear an area of the bad guys, you figure out a way to hold it with some kind of security forces, and then you build institutions to give people a better life. And that's the way that you defeat an insurgency in the long run. Though a lot of this is not just counterinsurgency, it also is modern warfare. Modern warfare amongst the people, that's what it's all about these days. Very, you know, the, the day of the, you know, you very rarely get to get the, the traditional tank on tank, soldier on soldier combat. Nowadays, there's always going to be a lot of people involved, a lot of more regular type forces. This is a diagram kind of modern warfare, really. Uh, we, we have what we call lines of effort, which are grouped um, thematic actions. For instance, combat operations is one, but it's not the only one. You're also rebuilding host nation security forces, providing essential services to the people, improving governance, new and economic development. These are all parts of your campaign plan. And it's all wrapped in information operations, so people know what you're doing. Uh, the idea is to change the populace where a majority of the populace is supporting the government. It's not just hearts and minds, it's more than that. You want to change, you got to change people's behaviors before you change their attitudes. Uh, there are different parts of the anatomy sometimes you have to grab besides hearts and minds to make people change their, their behaviors. And so there's some co very coercive things that go on here as well. But the bottom line is you're trying to change the people's support for a legitimate governing authority you're trying to, to help. And this is an example of how campaign design works. Uh, this is the uh, General Mattis, when he was in the 1st Marine Division in Anbar province, realized that he had three different enemies. You know, it's hard to determine if you're dealing with an insurgency or an insurgency's in these kind of wars. And he realized he had three different ones. He had a, a Sunni tribal insurgency. He had a former Ba'athist insurgency. And then he had Al-Qaeda, the foreign fighters come in from around there, around the region to wreak havoc and, uh, and cause chaos. And he understood he had to deal with each piece differently. The Sunni tribes were just, they were, they were trying to feed their families, kind of get back into society. The Shiite government had, had basically pushed them out. They were trying to reestablish themselves. Similar to the Ba'athists. The Ba'athists had been kicked out of government by Bremer's orders on the CP in the Coalition of Provisional Authority. They were trying to find a way back in. You could convert them if you approached them correctly. The Al-Qaeda fighters were different. You had to kill them. You weren't going to reconcile with them. You weren't going to bring them back in peacefully. You were going to have to kill or capture them. And so you've got different approaches for the different enemies. And in, within each enemy group, you've also got a criminal element that had to be dealt with differently as well. Very complex problem set. And what eventually happens over a couple years is we get these guys to kill those guys. Eventually, we get the tribes to turn on the foreign fighters and work with us. I mean, that's one of the nature, I'll talk, I'll show a slide on this in a minute, but the, that's the nature of this kind of warfare. But we basically get these guys back into the system and these guys back into the system and they start taking out those guys. And that's what happens in Anbar province, part of the awakening uh, there. Uh, we had a lot of bureaucratic battles with the manual as well. Uh, the, uh, just numbering the manual, for instance, it's, a, it's 324. So initially it was 307.3-07.22, which meant it was a subset of stability operations, which is a different category of, of military uh, campaign, much less violent than COIN. And I made the argument that we needed to change that. It was like a monk had walked into the Vatican and told the Pope, I want to rewrite the Old Testament. Uh, I, to people were saying, if you change the number of this manual, the whole doctrinal system of the U.S. Army will collapse in a pile. Uh, two weeks later, General Petraeus made the same suggestion, and it was a good idea then. <laughs> so obviously, they've been thinking about it the two weeks since I had given them the idea. Same thing happens in reference bibliography. I, I, I said we needed a reference bibliography to talk about suggested readings. The lawyers said no. You can't have a government publication recommending private works. General Petraeus made the suggestion, and again, it was a good idea. Uh, reading level. Most army doctrine, most doctrinal manuals in the military service are supposed to be at an eighth grade reading level. That's not because soldiers are stupid, it's because they're supposed to be read quickly. We made the argument that uh, 
No, we're, we're, we're shooting at a bunch of college graduates and battalion staffs and higher, so the reading level should be higher. We won that argument too. So it's a much more sophisticated manual than most. In fact, it has uh, been used a as a textbook at many major American universities. Big issue over the Abu Ghraib and the Taney Ops at the time. We had to resolve that. We had a battle with the Air Force about the air power appendix. It ended up that we had the, the Army refereeing between the Marines and the Air Force about what was going to go in that appendix in the manual. Uh, the intelligence people of Fort Huachuca were very uncomfortable with our social cultural intelligence approach. It was new, they didn't like it, it wasn't their idea. It took us two months to, to persuade them to agree to it. And in the middle of that, Ralph Peters jumped in with some very nasty editorials in the papers that the manual was too soft and didn't kill enough people. Uh, got invited out to Fort Leavenworth, had a debate. We changed seven sentences in the manual to reflect a little bit about more killing. And when the manual came out in December 2006, Peters wrote an editorial and said, this is the most improved government publication in the last 10 years. Uh, of course, six months later when his latest book came out, he changed back to hating it, but that's, you know, that's Ralph Peters. The other part that's caused controversy is the paradoxes, which was my contribution to some of the doctrine, maybe my, my, my most important one. The idea was that for this kind of warfare, you gotta think differently than conventional warfare. And for instance, the first one, the more you protect your force, the less secure you may be. You can't stay inside your compound. You've got to get out and patrol among the people, take some risk, or you're not going to get intelligence, you're not going to protect them, you're not going to find out what's going on. Uh, you know, sometimes the more force is used, the less effective it is. You know, you can, you can, again, it doesn't pay to kill an insurgent and create 50 more because of the backlash. Sometimes doing nothing is the best reaction. The enemies will often do, do actions just to prod you to do something that will make people angry or hurt a community. Some of the best weapons for coin do not shoot. Ballots and dollars are often more effective than bullets and bombs in these kind of wars. Uh, we want to teach the host nation to do th something on their own instead of us doing it for them. If a tactic works this week, it might not work next week. If it works in this province, it might not work in the next. The problem is our enemies are learning adapting too. We found out that something would the enemy had come up with a new kind of explosive device in Afghanistan, and two weeks later they were doing it in Iraq. Uh, it was, you know, the bottom line is you've got to stay ahead of your enemy's learning curve. The last one here, the way I wrote it was, most important decisions are not made by generals. <laughs> Guess who the last people are to review a doctrinal publication? <laughs> the generals are. They changed the dang thing. At least they kept it, but they changed the most to many. In fact, they added all these, initially I didn't have the qualifiers in here because I just wanted people to think about these things. But there was fear people would take these as dogma and laws, and so they put the qualifiers in there. But like I said, that one they changed at the last minute, but at least I got part of it in. But the, as I get into later, the most important decisions in counterinsurgency are not even made by military people, really. Now, a lot of people didn't like it, still don't like it. Uh, there's one group said that this, this the, you know, it goes back to some of Ralph Peter's critiques. They said the only way you win these kind of wars is by killing all the bad guys. Uh, Edward Lutwak actually wrote a piece he called a military malpractice and said you've got to, the only way you can be successful is if you make the people more afraid of you than they are of the bad guys. And we're not going to fight that way. That's just not the way we operate. He, he, he said we should fight the way the Nazis did in World War II. We're not going to do it. That's just... We're not going to do that. Again, Peters thought we should really focus on the enemy. There actually was a group I got ambushed at a conference at NYU. I walked in to do a presentation and find out the theme of the conference was counterinsurgency, the new imperialism. <laughs> I was not ready for that one. But there are some people that see this just as another way to, you know, to increase Western dominance of the world. Uh, some people have argued that civil wars like in Iraq are not coined. In reality, there's, they, they have a lot of the similar internal warfare characteristics. Uh, some people have said that it's all new, there's nothing old. Even Al-Qaeda uses Maoist terminology in their doctrine. I mean, the old ideas are still relevant, even though there's a lot new as well. The, 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 the arguments that have carried the most weight are the impossible and dangerous arguments. A guy named Jeff Record at the Air War College has argued that America can't fight these kind of wars because they take too long that our political system can't last beyond a four-year cycle, the American public gets bored easy, the American military doesn't want to fight these kind of wars, therefore we should not fight them. 
kind of the argument we should ignore them, we should avoid them. The problem is you know, the world doesn't work that way. Uh, but that's the argument, that we're always going to lose these kind of wars because we, we can't last more than four years. I mean, we've already disproved that in Afghanistan. The argument that's been most successful and really has won the day is the dangerous argument that, that focusing too much on counterinsurgency has caused us to lose our conventional capabilities. And we've got to focus back on those. And, and, we've, and, we've, and we actually convinced ourselves too much that we were too good at this and ended up getting embroiled in counterinsurgencies that are too long and too expensive. And again, that argument has really kind of won the day in Washington these days. It is our, as our national security strategy says, we're not going to do any kind of long-term nation-building efforts at all. No counterinsurgency, no stability ops, even though we're still in Afghanistan and we're going back to Iraq. Then there's one service who will remain unnamed that says we don't use air power enough in the doctrine. <laughs> I'll let you figure that out. But I, they have called me a Luddite for what I have written. Uh, so what happens is though, General Petraeus takes this doctrine to Iraq in 2007 to put it into application. And, and you all, you're all aware of the surge. Now the, the thing is, you gotta understand, it's, there is not a surge, there are surges. Yeah, I met with him in February of 07. He was headed over there and he said, there are four surges I need. I need a, sur a military surge. I need a surge in Iraqi political will. I need a surge in American political will. And I need a civilian surge of capacity to go along in the military surge. He got the extra military troops, which he and General Odierno used mostly to push the bad guys out of Baghdad and to clear the rat lines around Baghdad. Uh, a lot of Iraqis that are over there said the most significant part of the surge was just the announcement it was coming. A lot of the reasons the awakening happens is because Iraqis have the courage or, or their, their urge to rise up against the foreign fighters like Al-Qaeda is reinforced by the American announcement we're coming back in force. And they felt they could take the leap and, uh, and, and they would be supported by us. One of the reasons the surge in Afghanistan didn't work is because President Obama announces the surge the same time he announces a deadline, which is stupid. I mean, the, the reason for the surge is, that is to tell people you're coming and you're going to help them. You don't say, we're going to be there for a year and then we're going to leave, because then they have no incentive to help you, which is what happens in Afghanistan. Uh, we also have, it, we, ha we have a surge of political will at home, partly because of the creation of the doctrine which convinced everybody we knew how to fight these kind of wars. Also because a, a, a Michael Hanlon and Kenneth Pollack do an article in the uh, New York Times in, in late July 07 that says the surge is working, which changed the, the tenor of the democratic political debates from how we get out of Iraq to how do we take advantage of the success of the surge. So it changed the whole discussion of what was going on in Iraq and gave General Petraeus and General Erno more time for the military operations to work. The, most, the, the least successful part was the civilian surge. Uh, interagency just couldn't provide any more. General Petraeus achieved a partial, achieved a partial, a partial surge by giving civilian, the civilian uh, provincial reconstruction teams to military commanders to take care of, attaching them to brigades. He and Ambassador Crocker also joined at the hip to very successfully work with Maliki. But the problem was, is when Petraeus and Crocker left, a lot of that fell apart and the new administration did not continue it. So a lot of the civilian connections got lost fairly quickly. So that part of the surge was not as successful as he wanted it to be. Now a lot of things did work in our favor. You know, by the time this is going on, the Iraqis have been at war for four years. They're pretty tired of the violence. Uh, the Sunnis come to the realization that, our, that the Americans are their really only hope to get a position back in society. We became, in many ways, we became the referees between the Sunnis and the Shiites. It was almost like a hockey fight. Any hockey fans here? You know how a hockey fight works, right? When does the referee step in? Everybody's kind of tired, they're starting to stumble. Well, the Sunnis and the Shiites are both getting kind of tired and stumbling, so the Americans kind of walk in and separate and play referee. Al-Qaeda was also amazingly inept at insurgency. I mean, I talked to one sheikh over there and he said, you know, Al-Qaeda showed up and they said, there are, foreign, there are foreigners coming and they're going to take your oil, take your women, and take away your religion. <laughs> so that Al-Qaeda shows up. So six months later they say, you know, it's expensive protecting you people. We're going to have to start charging taxes. 
And then six months later, we're all lonely men far from home. We need your, <laughs> we need your daughters as wives. And then, they, then the last thing is they impose a very strict form of Sharia law on the local, the local Sunnis. So the Sunnis say, yeah, they were right. There are foreigners coming to take away our resources, women, and religion. But it wasn't you guys. It was them. And so they turn, they turn to us. Amazing, very good. I mean, it, it's, you should all be very proud of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines that are over in Iraq and Afghanistan now and were then because they have, they have learned amazingly well how to do this. Uh, how to disaggregate enemies and disaggregate friends because oftentimes our friends are a bigger problem than the enemies are. Uh, of course, I'd like to say it's because they read our doctrine and absorbed it in most cases because they're on their third or fourth tours. They learn, they learn over time. We also helped that a lot of the Shiite militias pull themselves off the table uh, and set up a truce. A lot of that forced by Petraeus already are no actions, but that helped us give that less, that took away one of our problem sets at a time it was useful. But unfortunately, the gains were lost when we left because the American forces were the glue of mosaic wars require mosaic peace. The reasons you have peace in Anbar province are different from the reasons you have peace in Baghdad, different from the reasons you have peace in Diyala or Mosul. And when the American forces pulled out and the diplomatic connections pulled out, all those, all those arbiters, all the glue that held the peace together fell apart as well. Now you can throw out some observations from Iraq and some of the things I saw when I was over there. This is my mandatory, I know Dave Petraeus picture. That's Dave, that's myself, that's a guy, John Martin, another classmate of ours uh, who was also over there working as an aide. And this is, uh, this is November 2007 in Baghdad. Uh, what really struck me is that what we were putting on the shoulders of our brigade commanders. This kind of war is really a colonel's war. Uh, it's the brigade commander's war. It's not a general's war, it's a colonel's war. This guy here is a guy named Ricky Gibbs. He was one of my students at the Army War College. And two years later, I ran into him. He's in Iraq, command of a brigade in South Baghdad. Here he is, he's opening a hospital. This Iraqi here is uh, in charge of a new hospital open up in South Baghdad. Uh, Colonel Gibbs's brigade included 10 combat battalions, which is the same size as a division, and his occupation zone was 1.5 million Iraqis. That's a colonel in charge of that chunk of Iraq. It's amazing the responsibility we put on those colonels. They, really, we ought to treat them like the British do and make them brigadier generals, probably. But, but it just, you know, it just it, it ties into the competence of the people we had over there, but also their immense responsibility we put on, responsibilities we put on our leaders. Another Petraeus initiative was to take people out of the forward operating bases. You know, that, that, that great Tolkien term, no more fobbits. Uh, take them out of the forward operating bases, put them out in these combat outposts. This is a place called Jerfo Shocker. About 100 troops out there all by themselves, about seven miles away from the nearest American base. So they're really stuck out there on their own. But what happens is when they set up all these combat outposts like this, uh, with very competent soldiers. This is uh, myself and General Huntoon, who is the, going to be the director of the Army staff. Steve Biddle, uh, an analyst from the Council on Foreign Relations. This is uh, Bo Balcavage, now chief of staff at the War College. John Henry Moltz, who was the captain in charge of Jerfel Shocker. And Mike Garrett, who eventually became a general officer, who was the brigade commander at the time. Uh, but we're all there. It was an immensely competent group. They set up these combat outposts. And what arises around these outposts are the sons of Iraq. This is a local sheikh who sent, came down from Tikrit to take charge of the sons of Iraq, which are the local militia that rose up around these outposts, mostly Sunni fighters, some Shiites as well. Uh, they start out being paid by us, and eventually some of them are paid by the Iraqi government. Uh, again, remember the, 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 the Mattis model for Anbar province, that Sunni tribes are just looking to get paid, to, paid to take care of their families, get back into the into the system, and this was one way to do it. I'm, out, I'm actually taking the picture. I'm out here with John Henry Moltz, the young captain. And he turns to me as I'm taking this picture, and he said, you know, I swear these guys were shooting at me last month. <laughs> and I said, Captain Moltz, welcome to counterinsurgency. Because that's what happens. These, so basically, the, the, the Sunnis turned to us and against Al-Qaeda. Uh, became our allies and not our enemies. And of course, the problem we had was then negotiating between the Sunnis and the Shiite government, because the Shiite government was still scared stiff that if we gave them weapons, they would turn on the Shiite government. Uh, very um, tough, 
diplomacy we had to do to get the Shiite government to accept these Sunni militias. But again, they became a key fight, a key tool in the battle against Al Qaeda. I'm not, now the slip, this is, General Huntoon is not a slippery character. That is not the target of this. Eventually went on to become superintendent of West Point as well. This is uh, Al Balani, who is the interior minister for the Iraqis. Interior ministry basically was creating sh Shiite death squads to go out and kill Sunnis. You know, we were training the troops, the, the, the police. The problem was the police. The, the Ministry of Defense controlled the army, but the uh, Ministry of Interior controlled the police, and they were creating Shiite death squads. And so Al Balani was, had just replaced the current guy who was a very, sec was a very evil sectarian, and he was trying to change that. But we ended up having more intelligence on our friends than our enemies. I mean, one of the things you had to do is you had to figure out who was really a friend and who was really was really not. And a lot of the people, especially in the Ministry of the Interior, were really evil people. And we had to get them out of there before we could really turn the police around. We did pretty good with the Army. The training in the Army went pretty well. Now the problem, of course, is when we left, Maliki changed all the leaders out and put his cronies back in and all the good people we had created were gone. Uh, but we did pretty well with the Army. The police was the biggest problem. And the key guy here was this guy. This is a Major General Hussein, who was a Iraqi two-star that was put in charge of national police and with our help eventually relieved every brigade and battalion commander in the, in the national police because they were, they were Shiite sectarians who were just out to kill Sunnis. Uh, he was a big hero with the Americans. Uh, he did a great job, turned the national police into a very useful organ against the bad guys and, and something that the peop people of Iraq could be proud of. As soon as we left, Maliki promoted him upstairs put him in charge of border guards, put his cronies back in charge of the National Police, the National Police disintegrated after that. But when I was over there in 2007, it was a pretty good organization based because of what Hussein had done. We also, there's a two-star Marine general in charge of the main detention camp at Buka named Stone. And he sets up these interesting programs with a coin behind the wire. Even when you captured a bad guy, the counterinsurgency effort did not end. It just changed focus. And what you end up with is what they called coin behind the wire. He set up, basically what you do is you bring in somebody into the detention camp. And they had about 25,000 people there when I was over there in November 2007. You separate them into reconcilables and irreconcilables. There were 5,000 people, mostly Russians, Chechens, uh, some Saudis, and a lot of foreign fighters. They, they were, you just locked them away and threw away the key. The other 20,000, though, you felt you could, re you could kind of rehabilitate. So what you did is you brought them in, you teach them to read, you bring in moderate imams to teach them a moderate form of the Koran, you let them read the Koran themselves, you also give them job programs to give them usable skills, you give them a, you set up a legal system to review their cases, and when they are released, they're released back to the local sheikh who then signs a loyalty oath and says he'll take care of them, and the other guys in the, Released individual also signed a loyalty oath that he would listen to the sheikh and stay out of trouble. And they were actually firing what they called moderate missiles back into Iraqi society. When I was over there, they had fired about 2,200 back, and two had, only two had been recaptured for doing bad things. Any prison in America would have been proud of that kind of recidivism rate. So it was a very successful program while I was over there to try to get, try to, to reform these people and get them back into society. And now the other thing we had, we had to change the whole court system to do it. The Iraqi legal system, when we came over there, the, the way an Iraqi trial was conducted is, an individual was arrested, a confession was beaten out of them, and then the trial was the individual trying to prove his confession was not true. So we basically, to turn their legal system more into an adversarial system. This is in one of the new courtrooms in Baghdad. This is where the witness is and this is where the defendant is. I asked the question about how come the witness has a Koran but the defendant does not? And the, one of the Iraqi lawyers told me, well that's because the, the uh, defendants are expected to lie and we don't want to embarrass them by having to put their hand in Koran. <laughs> Again, we still had some work to do on their, on their court proceedings. Uh, we also do a lot of movement control, a lot of coercive. We do more ethnic divisions than Al Qaeda does. We separate areas of Baghdad. I mean, Baghdad, 
Baghdad was a very cosmopolitan city. It was not when we left. We divided sectors ourselves because that was necessary for security. And we put a lot of these walls up. In this case, the Iraqis had painted them, but that's a wall we put up to divide Sunni and Shiite neighborhoods. This is the Iraqi electrical system. <laughs> uh, what happens is you've got, you've got the major lines, which are the, the, the free electricity. You want to screw up an economic system, give people free electricity. Uh, what happened is people would get about eight hours of free electricity, then it would run out because demand was too high. All these wires here run to local generators. So what happens is you've got these local generator guys that when the main uh, power goes out, they would turn on the local generators. This picture on my, the cover of the book is actually Baghdad at night, and all those lights are lights being driven by local generators. Uh, you know, so at Bang, you know, even though the, 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 the free electricity ran out, they still had plenty of electricity, uh, but it was not exactly the most organized of wiring systems. Uh, I actually asked one of the generator guys, I said, you know, you must be making money hand over fist. What, what, what else do you need from the government? He said, I want a job. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean you want a job? Well, in the Iraqi, because the Iraqis have been living in a centralized economy so long, for them, it was not a job unless it was given to you by the government. So if you did something on your own, that was not a job. So running, his, running the generators was not seen as a job. Uh, even though he had boxes of dinars in his garage from all the money he was making from his generator work. Uh, we had to learn to accept local solutions. That was a hard thing for us to do. But uh, the Iraqi solutions tended to be awkward. They tended to take a lot longer, but they were also much more permanent than what we came up with. This is, I'm having a meeting here with the, uh, the, this is the governing council of a town called Al-Zabai near Basra in the south. Uh, this is the local mayor. These are the local Sunni and Shiite uh, sheikhs who talked about how they'd get along fine and how great everything was working. Uh, this poor guy up here is getting beat up as the guy who runs the electricity. Typical. But, the, but the, basically they were talking about that the, uh, how they had solved their own problems with a lot of a British military help as well. But this was a local group who come up with their own solutions and, and when we were listening to them. Again, it was hard for us to do. A lot of times we also had to deal with people that had blood on their hands. When, when General Petraeus set up his reconciliation cells to do that, he often put British officers in charge instead of Americans because the Brits, because of their work in Northern Ireland, were, they, they had a much easier time getting along with people who had been killing them the week before than the Americans did. Uh, just the, the cultural thing about the way that that structure often worked. Now again, I talked about the fact that in 2011 we pull out. Uh, one of the things you've got to understand about American military interventions, if you want to accomplish national objectives, we are always going to be there a long time. And you probably, you, you probably, you're the right age. You remember Bill Clinton, we're going into Bosnia, we'll be out of here in six months. You remember, you know, talking about pulling out of Iraq in four months. That never happens. If we're going to be someplace and really want to make, fix the problems, we're going to be there for 30 years. Korea, it took 30 years after the Korean War before Korea became a democracy. It'll take a lot longer than that in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, you know, we're still in Germany, we're still in Japan. I mean, if we're really going to accomplish our objectives, we're going to have to stay there a long time. Everything unravels in Iraq. And I know how the heck you're going to fix the Sunni-Shiite-Kurd differences without some kind of an outside arbiter. I mean, the, the Iraq is a mess, we all know that. It wasn't just the military withdrawal, though. Diplomatic withdrawal was just as important. Uh, Petraeus and, and Crocker were dealing with Maliki every day. President Bush was, was handle, was ha had weekly VTCs with Maliki to try to teach him how to be a democratic leader. Uh, all that ended when the Obama administration came in. In fact, <laughs> orders went out to American ambassadors that Ambassador Crocker looked to be too subservient to General Petraeus and no American ambassador should be that cooperative with a military leader again. Uh, a, a terrible, terrible order that had, had nasty consequences in Afghanistan especially. Again, we know Iraq is still a mess, but again, to me, that's, that's a failure of foreign policy, not counterinsurgency. I mean, it's counterinsurgency, it, it wasn't allowed to finish. It had created a window for Iraqi political reconciliation to occur, but then the Iraqis and ourselves dropped the ball and that did not happen. And now we're dealing with the consequences in Iraq right now. 
Now, to throw this out, one of the, we work under this model in Washington of how American military interventions work. Military goes in, there's some kind of a crossover point where civilian organizations take over, or the United Nations, and then they handle a transition to civilian authority from the, for the host nation. That's the ideal. Never happens that way. I mean, it never happens that way. Civilian organizations never have the capacity, and when we have a successful reconstruction, the American military carries the main brunt all the way to the end. But that's just not a model anybody in Washington, including DOD, wants to recognize. But that's the result. If you look at Germany, Japan, any successful occupation we've had, any successful reconstruction operation, and we're still in Bosnia and Kosovo, at least the NATO or ourselves, it always requires a major military effort to make these things work. Uh, these are just, this is just a diagram to show that how long we are in a country. You can actually work out the success of our intervention is, 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 is directly attached to the number of years we are there in most cases. This is just an example of how long we have in different places after major conflicts. If to be successful, you've got to be there a long time. If you're there a short time, you usually fail. Now, we got a number of things wrong when we were doing this doctrine. The whole process was upside down. You're supposed to start with a national security strategy that leads to national military strategy, that leads to your joint doctrine, which leads to your service doctrine. We did it upside down. We started the service doctrine that eventually drove our national security strategy. That was not our intent. Uh, but there was just a vacuum there that we filled. And that's one of the reasons the counterinsurgency got oversold. COIN is not a strategy. Counterinsurgency is a way to accomplish a, somebody else's strategy. It's, it's a way to accomplish ends. Uh, and those ends are made by politicians and voters, not by the military. The, uh, the military had no say in setting those ends in Afghanistan, Afghanistan or Iraq. We did not pick the former government or the leaders. And another thing that we got wrong in the manual is we, we really should have been more explicit that the goals of our host nation leaders we're supporting are not necessarily the same as ours. They can actually be very different. And we've had major problems in both Iraq and Afghanistan getting those leaders to do what we think they ought to do. In many cases, because what we think they ought to do goes against their own interests, especially when they, they want to retain power. Now, just some general observations on modern war. I just got a couple slides left and I'll open to questions. The, uh, again, as I said, most of what we talk about as coin is really modern warfare. Ending these conflicts is immensely difficult. When you have all these different enemies out there, you'll never get them all to agree to anything. So you, you, in, in most cases, you just have to kind of manage the conflict most than, most than, more than, than win it. Uh, civilian agencies still can't do everything that's required in this kind of war. I mean, we still have more musicians in the Department of Defense than we have Foreign Service officers in the State Department. You could fit the whole Foreign Service Corps of the State Department on one aircraft carrier. That's how small it is. And because of that, mission creep is a self-inflicted wound. The, the military always ends up doing a lot of things civilians should be doing. Uh, decapitation strategies are two-edged sword. A lot of times you need those, you need to have leaders you can talk to. If you kill them, the person that replaces them is normally somebody you can't talk to. Uh, you gotta be able to disaggregate your friends just like your enemies, because you don't, you know, who your friends are might not be very clear actually. In irregular wars, if you think you are winning, you might be. If you think you're losing, you definitely are. Uh, this is a big one for the Air Force. Who controls the ground controls the message. If you do a bombing mission and don't control the ground, the enemy is going to spin that to look like you killed women and children, blew up mosques. You have to worry about the information aspects of any operation. Actually, the special operations forces are bigger, eat more, have made more mistakes like this even than the Air Force has. And they've, they've been succumbed too much to lure killing people, direct action. We've lost the Green Berets. Now everybody wants to be a SEAL or a Ranger because that's how you get in the movies and that's how you write books. <laughs> But in reality, the most valuable stuff soft can do is, you know, we've had a reversal of roles. Um, you know, foreign internal defense, security force assistance, and essential mission, but nobody wants to do it. It used to be a special forces mission. They don't want to do it anymore. Uh, now if you want to do, uh, provide advisors, do counterinsurgency, you grab a conventional soldier or marine. If you want to kill somebody, you go get a special operations guy. That's the exact opposite of the way it used to be. And I think we need to go back to that myself. We're still fighting one-year wars or four or seven-month wars. We're terrible on transitions. 
In Vietnam, they worried about individual replacements. It's worse with unit replacements. You have complete breakdowns in these transitions. So we still end up having a hard time, we have a hard time learning because as an organization leaves, it takes its knowledge with it and the new organization starts from scratch. Uh, everybody likes precision bombs. Sometimes the B-52s are still lovely. Every so often you gotta hammer somebody. So, you know, yeah, we talk about using force precisely. Sometimes you gotta hammer people. And this is, I've been quoted on this a number of times. There are two kinds of warfare, asymmetric and stupid. Everybody's always trying to fight different. Nobody, nobody's more asymmetric than us. The United States is the most asymmetric warfare fighter in the world. Nobody fights like we do. Uh, so whenever you hear the term asymmetric warfare, they're not talking about us, they're talking about everybody else. Which in some ways is a, you know, again, I, 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 I think we misuse the term a lot. But the bottom line is everybody's always looking for an edge. Nobody fights the same way. You've always got to be, be aware of the asymmetric aspects of any combat you're in. Now, some final dilemmas of counterinsurgency open to questions. Again, I made this point a couple times. U.S. military interventions are always going to be long and costly to meet objectives. Political leaders should be upfront with that, but they never are because they feel if they're honest that we're going to be there 20 years, nobody will approve the action. Just because you can do counterinsurgency does not mean that you should. But, to counter to that, just because you say you're doing counterinsurgency does not mean that you are. We never do counterinsurgency in Afghanistan. We've been there now for 15 years. We have never done counterinsurgency. We've said we are, but we've never committed the resources or done the actions that really are counterinsurgency. Again, this one is related to this one. The most important decisions affecting coin are made by politicians and voters, not generals. I got this quote from General Barbero, the J3 for General Petraeus in, in Iraq in 07. I don't know if we have the wrong form of government or the wrong people in it. <laughs> Talking about the Iraqis. Neither of those decisions, the military had no role in either of those decisions. We didn't have a pick, we didn't, we didn't have any choice in the leadership or the form of government. And yet that, those are the, really the key determinants of success in counterinsurgency. So the hand was already dealt to the military in many aspects before they had to deal with it. And again, much of what we call COIN is really just modern warfare. And, and, and I actually have been embroiled in a, in a project for the Partnership for Peace for NATO, trying to teach counterinsurgency to other nations, and there are currently 37 nations signed up that want our instruction. And I gotta admit that, that talking about the frequent flyer miles, of the 37, None of those places are what I would call guard spots. <laughs> uh, I'm not, you know, so far I've been in Nigeria and Moldova, and I'm not looking forward to some of the other countries on that list. Uh, the last point, though, I'll make is an, is an observation as an historian. And again, the current counter, the, our current national security strategy says we're not going to do coin or stability operations again. We have never been able to never do this again. So as a caution to everybody who says that we're not going to do this, we will. We always do. Okay.